As you can tell from my t-shirt and the paintings behind me, I'm not a huge fan of the low FODMAP diet. Don't get me wrong, it could be a really effective band-aid, but that's all that it is. It's a band-aid. And that gets lost a lot of the time. I've seen many people who get stuck on this diet for months or years at a time, either because they're scared to reintroduce foods, or because they try to reintroduce foods and it doesn't go well, or because they are told that they have to stay on this diet for the sake of starving the SIBO. But as I've covered here on this channel and on the IBS Freedom Podcast, we have zero evidence that we can actually starve SIBO with our diet, but we have ample evidence that the low FODMAP diet and probably diets like it create deepened states of dysbiosis. And that is not something any of us want to have. Dysbiosis is what probably is causing a lot of your symptoms, not the overgrowth itself. So where are you now? Like if you have tried to restrict your diet and maybe you've been on this diet for a while and you're feeling stuck or feeling confused, in this video, I'm going to talk about a few different options that could be used as alternatives for the low FODMAP diet per the research. They've actually researched this in human beings. And I hope that this gives you some guidance and some ideas of what you could do either in lieu of this diet or in addition to it. So without further ado, let me put myself in head bubble mode and I will share my screen. Okay. So the first couple of papers are all thematically similar, but they all, they're all they all different groups of people. So I'm going to share all of them. But the first is three studies that looked at a low FODMAP diet compared to what they call traditional dietary advice. So keep in mind that the term FODMAP was only coined in like 2009 or 2010. Prior to that, we didn't know what a FODMAP was and we didn't categorize foods this way. So instead we had kind of the old, the old trusty guidance that we would give to IBS patients. And that was outlined here, which is eating a regular meal pattern, AKA eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner around the same time every day, not, not being erratic with your eating behavior avoiding large meals. So as much as I love a good buffet, maybe not going to the buffet a whole ton and reducing the intake of fat, insoluble fibers, caffeine, and gas producing foods such as beans, cabbage, and onions. And they say here that there's a greater emphasis on how to eat rather than what food to ingest. That's really important. So there was more emphasis on the regular eating pattern and avoidance of large meals rather than telling people that they couldn't eat cabbage or onion. That was a relatively minor part of this guidance. And what they found in this particular cohort, for example, is that the low FODMAP diet and traditional dietary advice were about the same. They did four weeks of one or the other, and they split the cohort, and people felt better regardless. So I ask you at this stage of the video, which would you rather do? Would you rather cut out everything behind me, right? Onion, garlic, um, you know, avocado, apples, Brussels sprouts, would you rather cut out all of those wonderful, healthy, delicious foods, or simply learn to eat a regular meal pattern, avoid excessively large or excessively small meals, and maybe just reduce the intake of a couple of those things that they mentioned. To me that the latter sounds way more appealing, but you know, this is your journey, not mine. Let's go to the next study. Very, very similar efficacy of an uh, uh, efficacy and acceptability of dietary therapy in non-constipated IBS. And they compared this to, uh, there was low FODMAP versus traditional dietary advice again, versus the gluten-free diet. Now in this study, they did say the, where is it? Sorry, uh, Doug. Anyway, the overall symptomatic benefit was similar between the groups, maybe slightly better, but I don't think it reached statistical significance for the traditional dietary, or I'm sorry, for the low FODMAP and gluten-free compared to traditional dietary uh, um, guidance. But what they found here is that the traditional dietary approach, low FODMAP and gluten-free are effective in the, the, in the treatment of non-constipated IBS but traditional dietary advice is the most patient friendly in terms of cost and convenience. So again, they're basically saying, Hey, they all worked, but as far as what is sustainable and desirable from the patient's perspective, it's a hell of a lot easier to just eat a regular meal pattern, not eat excessively large meals and slightly reduce your intake of fat, caffeine and gas producing foods, as opposed to 
these big diets that have you restrict an awful lot of foods. Moving on, there's another one. So low FODMAP diet versus da, 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 versus traditional dietary advice again. And they said, similarly, this was a group of 100 Chinese patients. And they said that patients in the low FODMAP group achieved earlier symptomatic improvement in stool frequency and excessive wind. But ultimately, the benefit was the same. So it took a little bit longer for them to see a symptomatic benefit from the regular meal pattern, decreasing a couple of foods, that sort of stuff. But the end point was the same. So perhaps low FODMAP is better for the, uh, the less patient folk among us. I could give you that. But the end result was the same here. And it really goes to show you that both of these things can be valuable. And one of them is going to be a lot more sustainable and desirable from like a lifelong perspective. They also mentioned that the low FODMAP diet reduced carbohydrate fermenting bacteria, and they specifically named bifidobacterium. So when I had mentioned earlier that the low FODMAP diet causes deepened states of dysbiosis, this is one of the chief things that has been pointed out across many, 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 many studies. Bifidobacteria, which is one of our good, good, good guys, is chronically, or across the board, bifido is going to be reduced by a low FODMAP diet. And that is one of the hallmarks of this flavor of dysbiosis. And they mentioned that here too. So again, would you rather get there a little bit quicker, but ultimately reach the same end point? Oh, but also decimate your good microbes? Or would you rather spare your good microbes and just put in the time and work and get there just a little bit later? Personally, I'm, I'm patient enough. I would do the latter. But let's, those are the three studies that I wanted to point out for traditional dietary advice. But there's actually two other alternatives to the low FODMAP diet that have been studied in humans. So here's one, for example, randomized clinical trial of yoga versus low FODMAP diet in patients with IBS. And they found no statistical significant difference was found between the intervention groups. So this is wild, right? Would you rather cut out all of these high FODMAP foods and be like the weirdo who can't go to birthday parties anymore? Or would you rather do yoga twice a week? Because I shit you not, that's what this study looked at. They had people do yoga twice per week for 12 weeks. I mean, I know getting a yoga membership is an expense for sure, but especially with the plethora of free or cheap information on the internet, like hell, you could do yoga at home in your living room probably and still get at least some of this effect. I would absolutely rather do yoga, which is going to A, not harm my microbiome, B, be a lot easier to implement, C, spare my social life and my relationship with food. And I'm losing track of what I've already said. It just Yoga is so much more appealing, in my opinion, especially if it's only two days per week. If it was like seven days a week, that might be a hard sell. But, you know, which would you rather do? Yoga two days a week or decimate your dietary diversity? I know which one I would pick. And then last but not least, there's also a randomized clinical trial of gut-directed hypnotherapy. This would be something like the Nerva app or low FODMAP diet. And unsurprisingly, they found that There are durable effects of gut-directed hypnotherapy, and they are similar to the low FODMAP diet for the relief of GI symptoms. And they did say that hypnotherapy was superior to the dietary intervention for psychological indices, aka if you had anxiety or depression or a psychological mental health kind of thing going on, obviously the gut-directed hypnotherapy was way more effective than that uh, against those symptoms versus the dietary therapy. I mean, honestly, I would wager a bet that doing the low FODMAP diet or a really restrictive diet is terrible for your mental health. So again, the the whole point of this is which would you rather do? Would you rather kind of clean up your diet in a really like nonspecific way, just eat healthier and have a regular meal pattern and maybe do yoga a couple times a week and maybe do something like Nerva to get your gut brain connection connected better? Or would you rather decimate your microbiome and your dietary diversity and your relationship with food? Hold on, I can come out of head bubble. And I say that not to be flip. I'm not trying to be a jerk, right? Like I know that this is a big decision and I know that a lot of people land on this diet 
because they were told to by a well-intentioned healthcare practitioner, or they did a lot of research and they felt this was the right thing for them. And you might be watching this thinking, but the low FODMAP diet really, really helped me. And that's great. It's just, again, I don't want you to be stuck on it forever. And that's where I see a lot of people fall. A lot of people find that it works for them to some extent or another, and then they just kind of camp out there and they don't realize what a toll it's taking on their physical and mental health and their microbiome. So if you hadn't explored this already, or if you hadn't thought about some of these other avenues, I hope that this video shed some light on that for you. Of course, I realize I probably just threw a huge monkey wrench into your life. Here you are doing this diet. It was hard in the beginning, but you probably figured it out. You have your alternatives, your recipes, your do not eat list. And then I come along and say, hey, this is really meant to be a short-term Band-Aid, and these are some things that might work instead. And you might even be in the position where you've tried to get off this diet numerous times and have failed. It can be really, really hard to do, especially if you've been on this diet for a while. Or maybe you're scared that if you eat the FODMAPs again, you're going to be feeding SIBO and your SIBO is going to come back. I get it. I've worked with people in all of these circumstances and more. And if you're feeling like this, or you're just confused or frustrated or overwhelmed and needing a sense of direction, I hope that you'll check out FODMAP Freedom in 90 days. We're enrolling on Monday the 19th. So just in a couple of days, we're going to be opening the doors again. And I get really great results with my students. In addition to decreasing or eliminating symptoms of bloating, diarrhea, constipation, abdominal fatigue, and abdominal distension, I'm really freaking good at helping people reintroduce these FODMAPs. Again, that's why I have the goofy t-shirts. That's why I have the paintings. I'm really passionate about what I do because I'm of the opinion that we should be able to eat these foods with abandon. And I just, I love seeing people's lives turn around when they're finally able to go out to a restaurant again or eat a family recipe that they haven't had in a while or enjoy their Thanksgiving dinner for the first time in years. So anyway, if any of this resonates and if you are feeling like you need a change of pace and you want to figure out your body and what it needs, I really hope that I get to meet you in FODMAP Freedom this fall. I get great results. And if I don't get great results with you, I'll just give you your money back. There's a 100% money back guarantee on the program. So really, what have you got to lose other than your restricted diet and a bunch of symptoms you don't want? Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.